A different way of thinking about man, animals, and the environment has emerged in our country within the last few decades and is becoming ever more prominent in our government and the rest of American culture. This philosophy, known as environmentalism, is constantly shaping our decision makers' thoughts and policies. It was in this mindset that the decision was made by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with the support of numerous environmental and animal rights groups to transplant wolves from their homeland in Canada and release them in Yellowstone National Park in central Idaho in 1995 and 96. Nothing like this had ever happened before. The agency praised their decision. It almost seemed as though they were triumphantly heralding the return of some unjustly banished royalty. But their real triumph was that, by elevating animal over man once again, this non-essential experimental population of wolves granted them access to tens of millions of dollars and greater control over both private and public property. You see, putting wolves in Yellowstone was never about saving wolves or balancing ecosystems. There was another agenda, one they would not reveal to the American public, but would see through, no matter how far they had to bend the rules, no matter how bad they had to lie, no matter how much they had to steal, no matter the cost. And they did it. What's done is done. And nobody has ever looked back since. Until now. I guess I should start from the beginning. It all started out as a journey. I wanted to learn about wolves, the transplant of them to Yellowstone National Park a decade and a half ago, and how these animals are really faring now. Because, amid the sea of emotions and confusion that surrounds this topic, one scarcely knows what to believe when it comes to the current status of these dominant predators. Okay, so we came up to the top of this hill, and we looked out across this mountainside. The whole pack of wolves is headed right for this herd of buffalo. Take a look. But it didn't take me long before I began to realize that it wasn't about wolves at all. At the root of the issue, there lies a monster much bigger and much more ominous than any wolf could ever be. I think what might happen is we're gonna see the wolves and uh, we're, gonna, we're just gonna zone out, we're gonna completely start wigging out. This is me, a year and a half ago when I first set out into the unknown before I knew how badly I had been robbed or lied to. I grew up here in southwestern Montana, where I came to love God's great outdoors and first began to get into filmmaking. It was also while I lived out here that I became interested in wolves too. We would even see wolves not far from our house from time to time. Little did I know where these two interests would take me. And even though this project is to be my first real film, with a little help from my family and friends, I was convinced I could get the job done. Oh yeah, I cut my eyes out of the shot. Let's try it again. I sure hope we turn out to be fast learners. How do you use the zoom on this thing? While it is true that some ranchers have had it tougher than others, it all depends on location. The closer to good wolf habitat the ranch is, the more wolf trouble is experienced. My journey began by taking me back to where I spent most of my childhood, in the beautiful Big Hole Valley in southwestern Montana. Right here in this valley since 96, since reintroduction, they were almost here immediately. They, they introduced them in Idaho. But, so 13 years, we've had wolves. But right now, we're at levels like we've never seen before. It took many, many years to get rid of the wolf to where we could live with him and maybe it was clear into the 40s before they finally got rid of the last of the wolves in the, in the big old area. The Petersons have ranched here since the settlement era. Dean's great-grandfather, Sam Peterson, came to America from Sweden in 1882 and then moved to Montana to work in his smelter. Not long thereafter, he went to the big hole and found the place he had been looking for, homesteaded it, got married, and moved into a one-room dirt floor cabin. They had eight children. The early homesteaders overcame many challenges, and so have their descendants. One of the latest difficulties facing them now is the return of the wolf. It's a co it costs us money. This is another 
another thing that costs us a percentage of what we're trying to do, and it's right off the top. It's off the gross. These wolves, they can come in, take a calf of mine, a five, six hundred dollar calf, and hey, he might come back tomorrow and get another one. The wolf is only doing what he's created to do. But what he does also hinders what I'm trying to do to make a living too. Because I'm trying to raise cattle and sell them to survive. Right. He's trying to eat something to survive. And that's the conflict. They're stealing from me. Every night they're stealing from me. You know, one way or another. And it starts with, you know, we got depredation, but we also, we also, if they're just in the cattle, they're harassing the cattle, you lose weight. You know, and you, you can have cows abort calves under stress. Fred Hershey is a neighboring rancher who has lost many cattle to wolves. And as I found out, it's not just the dead cows that count. I think it was in June, 10th of June is roughly. We split a bunch of heifers, brought some of them down to the home place here and uh, turned some of them out up what we call the Highland Ranch. And the ones up there, the wolves tormented them off, off and on. It got real bad this fall. They just killed ten, uh, six, six of them right in the, like two or three weeks before we shipped them. Yeah, that's pretty easy to figure. Six times they brought 700 and some dollars a head. So, you know, that's mm -hmm. 4,200, probably 40, yeah. some hundred. And we weighed the ones up there the first day and the ones down here the second day. And the ones down here weighed 64 pounds more than mm -hmm. the ones the day before. Yeah. But uh, you figure that 64 pounds a piece at 87 cents, that's what they brought. That's close to over 28,000 bucks. Yeah. That was just one deal that we could, we knew about, I mean, so. You know, how often does it happen? Shrink uh, stress-induced weight loss by uh, mainly by fear, being chased around, affects all the cattle, not just the one that was killed. So you lose all the pounds on the one that was killed, and then you then you lose a percentage on on the rest of them, and you, you value that at 90 cents or a dollar or a dollar ten these days a pound, and that quickly quickly adds up. 25 yeah. pounds a head, 500 head. I believe there's four packs on the west side of the Big Hole. The Minor Creek pack is last seen was 14 wolves. The Hairpin pack or the Horse Prairie pack on the south end of the valley last seen was eight or nine wolves. The Music Brook pack a month ago was seen 15 wolves on a hillside in a rancher's cattle on four okay. And then the, the Battlefield pack a few years ago, how many eight, were in? 18 to 18. start with. How many in the Steel Creek pack? There was 20. This summer. The Big Hole truly is a hotspot for wolves these days, and these wolves keep causing lots of trouble. So much trouble that in 2009, state agents took out nearly 50 problem wolves in the Big Hole Valley alone. Since state trappers now are spending most of their time dealing with wolves, they aren't as able to keep other predators, like coyotes, in check anymore. So this year, they can't even come and fly for us. They haven't been there for about a year. This year when they gathered the sheep over there, they're 50, I think, six lambs short because of the coyotes. I'm not, I mean, it wasn't the wolves, but the reason the, the government trappers couldn't get there is because they're too busy messing with these wolves. And a lot of people that, that are supposed to get this compensation for these, these wolves, it doesn't, it doesn't come, or it's six months and, and you get half of what you're supposed to. We don't need, we've never taken any compensation for any of the kills. Now it's mostly taxpayer money that pays for it, so, you know, I, mean, I don't think that's right. And the other deal is, is I think, you know, by taking that, that money, it's like you're saying the system's okay. And I'm saying, look, I, the system is no good. Wolves have definitely made life a little bit tougher for these cowboys, especially when you consider that the average ROA for ranchers is often in the negatives. This is why in the early days, you either got rid of wolves or went under. A rancher in the next valley over told me how his grandfather had spent most of his ranching career out trying to protect his herds from the wolves. One wolf he shot in particular was a little more than unusual. Yeah, my grandfather ran the ranch and the wolves were about putting him out of business. And he spent a lot of his career shooting and by legend shot hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And then 
this great white wolf, this arctic wolf, was, you know, doing a lot of damage as well, and, and running with other wolves. Mm -hmm. And this is a confirmed arctic it's wolf. It's a confirmed arctic wolf. This great arctic wolf traveled all the way to Montana with his female in search of new territory. This is one of the farthest south, if not the farthest south, that an arctic wolf has ever been documented. The Smithsonian Institution has even been after the skull. While Sandy's grandfather was working hard to protect his herd and provide for his family, his grandmother had befriended the local Indians. Before I left his place, I got to handle the gun his grandfather used and see much of what his grandmother had collected from trading with the Indians. Wanting to know more about the history of wolves in this country, I packed up and headed to Gillette, Wyoming to talk to wolf researcher T.R. Mater, founder of the Abundant Wildlife Society of North America. In the first initial years, it was starting like in the Library of Congress and in the National Archives because uh, the precursor to the Fish and Wildlife was the U.S. Biological Survey. And most people don't know this, but the U.S. Biological Survey was the agency that helped their ranchers eradicate the wolves in the first place because they were so destructive on livestock. And there was a, there was a misconception going on back then that uh, had to be cleared up by the government. And what that was, the ranchers said, uh, listen, wolves are really devastating our herds. And there was no question that was happening. I mean, they saw it day in and day out. And it's a cruel way to die because a lot of the animals suffered for days until somebody found them because they'd be hamstrung or whatever the case be. Hind legs wouldn't work or gutted, but not dead. And uh, anyway, the ranchers were mad, and say, especially in, in the West here, saying, you got all these national forest reserves, which are now our national forests, and they serve as breeding habitat for wolves. So the government sent out naturalists. They didn't call them biologists back then. They called them naturalists. They, they sent a bunch of naturalists out to do some studies. And what was found out was the forest reserves were not the habitat for the wolves. <laughs> the backyards of the ranchers' places themselves were. And so the wolves never went in the high country. And that's one of the big misconceptions that the government made lots of hay out of. And that was, let's put wolves in Yellowstone. And wolves never were in Yellowstone until we forced them in there with the, with the pressure from the government eradication program on the lower levels. And so when you know that, then you know that the wolves aren't going to stay there, which they didn't. Yellowstone Kelly, a scout for the U.S. Army who earned his nickname for scouting out the Yellowstone Valley in the 1870s and 80s, was an eyewitness to the destruction wolves were causing to wild game. It was said that wolves killed more buffaloes than the Indians and the whites combined. I'm convinced that the men engaged in poisoning wolves for their pelts rendered a good service in protection of herds of wild game. I have seen in the north bands of wolves numbering 50 or more traveling with noses up on the scent of buffaloes borne by the wind. They killed the young calves and hamstrung the cows and bulls. Even in the late 1800s, men like Kelly and others were doing what they could to control wolves and protect game herds. They shot, trapped, and poisoned the wolves whenever they could. In the decades between 1870 and 1930, tens of thousands of wolves were taken out because of the damage they were doing to stock in wild game herds. But despite the fact that wolf devastation was well documented, modern day proponents of wolf restoration still claim wolves were unjustly eradicated, that we misunderstood them and didn't see their value as social partners. Europeans seemed universally to associate wolves with the devil, pagan worship, evil, and man's bestial nature. Wolves, along with werewolves, became tied to man's baser emotions with debauchery, sacrilege, witchcraft, and sorcery. In the last 40 years, after centuries of fantasy and superstition, wildlife research has yielded a new picture of the wolf as a social creature and an important member of natural ecosystems. The writers of the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf Recovery Plan blame the eradication of wolves on ignorant and religiously superstitious European immigrants. 
but it was the suppression of wolves by the U.S. Biological Survey and men like Kelly that not only allowed for an increase in cattle and sheep production, but it also, in conjunction with wise conservation practices, allowed elk, deer, moose, and other wildlife populations to grow into some of the largest, healthiest game herds ever known to mankind. Conservation helped make those wildlife populations the healthiest, the most productive, the most numerous, on and on, abundant wildlife. But today, these wildlife populations are no longer valued as a resource to be managed for the benefit of people. The needs of man are no longer a priority. One of the humans whose needs and desires have been thrown to the non-humans is hunting guide and outfitter Bill Hoppy from Gardiner, Montana. A fifth generation Montanan, Bill's great grandfather was the first recorded white child born in the Montana Territory. Their family has hunted and guided in the Gardiner Basin just north of Yellowstone for four generations, but today they hunt here no more. The wolves have literally put them out of business. In 1988 or 89, Congress appointed the Delphi 515, 15 biologists uh, from around the United States or around the world maybe, to uh, study the possibility of putting wolves back in the Yellowstone Park. They did a study that was five years long. But in going into this study, those, those scientists were told, you know, they were given some guidelines by Congress. They were told not to... Uh, you know, make sure you don't hurt ranching, and make sure you don't hurt hunting, and make sure you don't hurt the economy of the surrounding areas, and don't make sure you don't affect endangered species that are already present in the area. So they did their study, and when they came back with their study, they had accepted a, a, a computer model by a guy named Mark Boyce, who was a biologist from somewhere, that said, yes, you can have yellow, you can have wolves in the Yellowstone ecosystem. You can have 78 to 100 wolves, and it should take 10 to 20 years to accomplish this number. But you can be underneath all these guidelines if you keep within 78 to 100 wolves. Well, we all know what happened. I mean, they they put the wolves in here in '95 and '96, and nobody's ever looked back. Uh, Nobody has ever paid any attention to that document or that study uh, and refused to. Uh, and over the course of the last 14 years, 13, 14 years, the wolves have, have, have decimated the largest migrating elk herd in the world. It was never determined. That's what they had to have in each of the recovery areas, three recovery areas. They wanted 10 breeding pairs that uh, successfully raised pups for two years, I think. Well, that was reached in 2002, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Didn't make any difference if that was written in the law or the agreement or the contract. I would look at all this stuff as a contract that was made between the government and the people of this state. It was a contract, and they, they broke it in a thousand different ways. They never looked back. They never ever looked back. They changed the rules daily. One one little story that will puts a light on that deal is in 1997 or 98 a female wolf made a den and had pups for two or three years right by my hunting camp. But because she never had a male with her, she never had a, a male that they could tell she was, never, she was never counted as a breeding pair. But over the course of two or three years, she probably produced 20-some pups. But she was never, ever counted as a, as, a, as a breeding pair, so she never went toward meeting the criteria. It was crooked from the start. Many sportsmen groups, like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, are beginning to take up arms over how this is being handled. You take, for example, the Northern Yellowstone herd, which was the showcase elk herd in the world, not in Montana, not in Wyoming, in the world. This was the showcase herd, some 19,000 head uh, by all estimations and all counts 
in the mid-1990s when wolves were reintroduced. Today, the most recent winter count that we just got about two weeks ago, that herd is at about 4,500. 24% reduction in numbers from just last year alone. Those are huge declines. The Bitterroot herd in western Montana, it's, I believe it's below 1,000 now. I mean, it's in real jeopardy of basically being gone. They may have to shut the Bitterroot area down to all hunting, period, uh, to try and protect that elk herd. And this data goes on and on, uh, and it will continue to go on more and more as the wolves disperse and as they spread. Uh, we now have wolves in central Montana. Our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks people don't like to talk about it. They won't acknowledge it, but it's a fact. You go ask the landowners there. You go ask the feds, the federal agents that are having to uh, police these wolves and manage them now, and they'll tell you that there's wolves in central Montana. There's been wolves spotted as far east in Montana as the Powder River. They're in the Black Hills in South Dakota now. Nobody's acknowledging them. We know they're in northern Utah now. They've been sighted several times in northwest Colorado. This is what wolves do. This is the way they were made. They were made to disperse. I mean, I can't argue with their numbers. I, I've never have argued with their numbers. I've, I've doubted them. But, you know, their numbers is that well, at the start of this thing, that each wolf would have to kill 23 or 24 elk per year to sustain life. It's called biomass. I've never heard anybody that's disagreed with it. I mean, Alaska agrees with it. Canada agrees with it. Everybody you ever talk to agrees with it. Well, 23 or 24 elk per year isn't a lot if you're only talking about 30 wolves. But if you start talking about 200 wolves, you know, if you start talking about 200 wolves inside a Yellowstone Park, which at one time they had that, uh, or pretty close to that, uh, you're talking about, you're talking about five, 6,000 head of elk that have to be eaten every year to sustain life. And that's not counting, that's not counting the elk that they killed in the spring when they killed the baby calves. Not being a university specialist professor in that, I wanted to talk about this type of a thing from the perspective of the everyday Montanan. And there's so many aspects when you start looking into it that wolves affect. There are increasing wolf hunter interactions. There's a, a greatly reduced amount of game. Um, other states, Western Hunter magazines based out of Arizona, in a recent issue, they were doing an overview of 2011 hunting in Western states. They flat out said in their article, don't go to Montana, you're wasting your money. Just because the quality and quantity of game animals has dropped. My father and I, dad's hunted one area where we bow hunt for 36 years now. I've hunted there for 11. In the area we bow hunt, dad has hunted through huge winters, fires, poaching people that have come in and wiped the animals out. They've always come back. There's never been overabundant animals, but they've had a sufficient healthy herd. Now you're lucky to find tracks from maybe five in the whole area, and there's wolves everywhere. Um, they just they decimate the animals when they go in. We never got anything from our politicians in the state of Montana ever to ever try to curtail what was going on here. Uh, we were called windshield biologists. We were called stupid. We didn't have a Ph.D. in biology. How could we possibly know I sit here every day and watch these animals every day of my life. And I was telling these people for years, there's no calf elk. When we finally got a, 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 a few politicians and a fish and game commissioner to come one evening and count a bunch of elk down there on the winter range, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. You know, I think we come up with 11 or 14 calves per 100 cows that we counted. You cannot sustain an, any kind of a herd, elk or deer or domestic cattle or sheep or horses or human beings with with that kind of a with that kind of a survival rate this statewide moose harvest data from Montana Fish Wildlife and Parks clearly shows how the moose harvest has been steadily decreasing since the wolves were reintroduced the 2010 harvest was down 36 percent from pre-wolf levels but in some higher density wolf areas like the Big Hole and Gardner moose have been hit much harder. They ate most of the moose that used to be here. They allowed the highest concentrations of wolves 
in the Northern Hemisphere to be right here for, for the last 15 years. And they've, they've just eaten everything. Uh, moose, if, the, if, the, if, the, if they could snap their fingers and wolves were to disappear tonight, I don't believe the wolves in this, or the moose in this area could ever recover. So then the Park Service and the force and the, and the fish and game came out. They, they want to blame it on the bears. Well, the bears have always eaten. The bears have always eaten calves in the spring. But bears, bears, after a calf elk gets old enough to jump up and run with, a, with, with its mother or with a herd of elk, those bears don't chase them very far. I mean, I've watched them. A bear might chase a calf elk for 100 yards. Those wolves never stop chasing them. From the day they're born till the day they kill them, they, they, they chase them. Mm -hmm. in, in 1997, I had uh, some people from uh, West Virginia riding in, in Lamar Valley. We saw four wolves kill at least 10 baby calf elk in less than 10 minutes and never ate a one of them. And it is, I believe, it is in, in, in many ways an assault on the sportsman and hunting culture. Uh, it's no secret that there are a number of anti-hunters in the country. And you know what? That's fine. They're allowed their opinion. They're allowed their perspective. But I am too. I live here. I have just as much right to have my culture, which I grew up with. I've hunted for over 50 years. I've raised my kids to be the same. Um, the North American model of wildlife conservation is built around the sportsman since the days of Teddy Roosevelt. We have the most bountiful, successful uh, wildlife resources in the world, bar none. And we have the most successful wildlife system. And the key component to that entire system is the sportsmen and how they participate in the process. Montana is a hunting state. It's in the blood. And it's also in the state's constitution. Preservation of harvest heritage. The opportunity to harvest wild fish and wild game animals is a heritage that shall forever be preserved to the individual citizens of the state. Hunting is also one of the largest industries in the state, generating hundreds of millions of dollars every year. About one quarter of the citizens of Montana over the age of 16 carry a hunting license. The economy, I mean, it has just, I think it has really hurt the economy of this, of this area. You'll, and when, every time we would bring that up, the environmental groups or whoever would counter by saying, the wolf watchers that come to Yellowstone Park are bringing $23 million, I think was the number, annually to the surround, to the area. Let me tell you what, that's the biggest lie as ever was told. Uh, and if I'd like to see where the 20, go down and ask any businessman in Gardner, Montana, if they've seen any of that 23 million bucks. The elk populations that are in the, in the park, you know, one time was the largest herd of elk in North America. Uh, the wolves uh, have decreased the numbers that, that would come out, that would migrate to, to their winter feeding grounds. The elk tag numbers have been cut 90 percent uh, as, as of today from approximately 1,200 down to 120. Huh. And uh, our, our January and February business was very dependent on all those hunters. And you know cutting 90 percent that takes a big toll on our winter economy. Um, I, I don't like closing as mm -hmm. much as I am forced to basically. Yep. It's also skewed for years. You know, you go into Yellowstone Park, and when you'd come out, they'd ask you if you saw a wolf. And if you said yes, they marked you down as seeing a wolf. Well, so therefore, you must have come to Yellowstone to see a wolf. Well, not very many people throw their underwear in a suitcase and say they're going to Yellowstone simply to see a wolf. Some do, but not very many. Number two is, most of those people don't know if they saw a wolf or a coyote. 
so that they ask all these questions. They ask all these questions that can be swayed in their in their direction. Other impacts we had taxidermy. Some local taxidermists in the Missoula area are they're still in business and they're surviving, but the Montana game portion has just totally dropped away. Meat cutting is another industry. The outfitters, the Gardner area was hit first. They had seven to eight that have, have gone out of business because they just simply don't have the animals. They can't in good conscience sell these to out-of-state people to come in. You have to begin to wonder, as I did, did they ever intend for wolves to stay inside of Yellowstone National Park? No, it was just a selling point to get the public behind the the program. Uh, first of all, Yellowstone National Park is not native habitat to wolves, and we documented that in our report uh, a natural wolf transplant in Yellowstone National Park. And because we did such a good job at taking their own data and proving that wolves were not native to Yellowstone, they commissioned another great big report, and they specifically said right in it that the greater Yellowstone ecosystem was habitat for wolves. Now, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem it consists of about uh, millions of acres instead of the 2.2 million acres in the park itself. Okay, so we climbed, like I was saying, we, we ended up racing up to the top of this hill and uh, we did catch glimpses of the pack as they ran off down the Lamar River. Um, we're gonna head back to the car see if we can uh, see him again. I highly doubt it, but it was, it was pretty neat. They ran right past the herd of buffalo, and then uh, you could just hear the buffalo snorting at them and stuff, but uh, they went right on around. This nation was founded on Judeo-Christian ethic, commonly called Christianity. And if you study the Bible, the one thing you understand that man has dominion and man has a stewardship responsibility. I mean, there's no question about it. And we derived the concept of conservation from a biblical mandate. It comes from the Bible. And conservation by definition is this, the act of conserving the wise and prudent use of natural resources. Now within that scope, dealing with wolves, comes wolf control. I try to generally try to explain this to urbanites, because urbanites don't get it. The urbanite argues this way, well why, why is the farmer shooting that coyote? The coyote just wants to eat. And so I turn that around and I say, um, why are you stopping that shoplifter? He just wants to eat. And then all of a sudden they kind of get it. To help me gain a more clear understanding of man's relationship to nature, Dr. Stephen Van Tassel's name came up. He is on staff at the University of Nebraska and also holds a PhD in theology. Some of the most radical environmentalists are, are people sort of in their, you know, 10th floor penthouse looking over uh, Manhattan. They're the most far removed people from the environment that you can get. What they really have is there's sort of this vision of the environment, um, but yet they will attack the cockroaches like there's no tomorrow. So there's an element of what I would argue is a fundamental hypocrisy. And if you press hard enough, you'll find it. God has blessed the earth with, with abundance. And we keep forgetting that. 
I mean, part of our free, people are talking about free trade and how American jobs are losing. We have literally thousands of people across the country who make a portion of their living from the fur trade. But unfortunately, in our society, it's becoming increasingly demonized by a group of people who think that killing an animal is fundamentally evil. So the question then becomes is why, so we keep restricting our ability to harvest wildlife. I tell people all the time, fur trappers, you, when a fur trapper goes into the woods, he generally doesn't change the habitat. So he's a, talk about green jobs. It doesn't get much more renewable than this. You're able to go into a forest, trap the animals that are there, leave, and no one really knew you were there. Because the earth has been, God creates a productive planet. Next generation comes through all well and good, and this is what a regulated harvest is all about. In the last several years, wolves have been on and off of the endangered species list multiple times as lawsuits from environmental organizations flew and federal judges outstepped their bounds. But it is not about whether wolves are on or off of the endangered species list here in the lower 48. It is about whether we are able to effectively control their numbers. The wolf situation in Alberta makes for an interesting case study. The wolves are not endangered or protected in no. Alberta, no. yet they're still a problem. Yeah. It's a, there's a myth about wolves that's been perpetuated since Farley Mowat's book um, that wolves are this grand species that, that only eat field mice. And uh, it's been really, it's been really frowned upon to get into the, the uh, wolf mitigation uh, end of work. And uh, there, there's just not a lot of trappers left. There's not a lot of people left hunting wolves. They're not worth much. So there's, there's, there's not much incentive for anyone to do it. And, and they, they run into all kinds of barricades with uh, regulations and whatnot. There are tens of thousands of gray wolves in Canada many of which live in the province of Alberta. Although the wolf is hunted and trapped almost year-round in Alberta, the hunting and trapping is unable to keep the wolf population in check. Over the course of all these years that I've been involved in this, we got to know a lot of people, and, and people that were, that, that know. There's a guy named Jim Beers. He was in the he was in the Reagan administration for years. Uh, then I think he was in the Clinton administration. He end, he ended up anyway for several years in the in the Federal Fish and Wildlife. The General Accounting Office asked for a, for an audit of the Federal Fish and Wildlife, and he said it's on paper, black and white, that he can prove that I that I think the number is 60 million. That 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 they stole 60 million dollars from the Pittman Robinson Fund, which is. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's my excise tax on all sporting goods that the feds put on, and then it's supposed to be doled back out to the states to manage their wildlife. Believe it or not, federal agencies never get audited unless Congress directs an audit by the GAO. Now think about that. All the complaints that go on about Enron and all these other places, oh, audit, audit, audit. Fish and Wildlife is the, the government. None of these agencies ever get audited routinely. Congress asked me, and I did, I went up there for two and a half weeks, went through all 14 boxes, and I had yellow grease pencils, red, red pencils, red pens, green pens, and I went through and started marking what was wrong, and what I found in the two and a half weeks, and what GAO confirmed later, and I had several meetings with them, kind of off the record, Fish and Wildlife Service had stolen between 45 and 60, looking back now, it's probably closer to 70, 60 million dollars out of that money that was supposed to go to the states for fish and wildlife management, okay? And the primary use of it was to introduce wolves into Yellowstone, okay? That's where they got the money to do that because Congress, the Congress had turned down a request in 1995 from the people in the Fish and Wildlife Service and Interior knew that they would never get any money now. So somebody made a decision. Congress said no to the wolves. The people who live here didn't want them either. In fact, the states primarily affected by the wolf transplant, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, all passed resolutions, memoriams, or petitions against wolf recovery in their state legislatures. 
and this posed a problem because before the federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service could release wolves in the area, the Endangered Species Act required an EIS, or an Environmental Impact Statement, part of which called for the support of the locals who were against the idea. And so what the feds do, instead of listening like they said they would, they took and made meetings for the EIS all across America. There was a, a public hearing, which normally it would take place if they were going to do wolf transplant here, they would, they would do it in this area. But that's the way all, all EISs were, except for the wolf one. There was hearings in Washington, D.C. There was hearings in Anchorage, Alaska. There was one in Seattle, Washington. There was one in Denver, Colorado. And, and there was a few around the, uh, the area, uh, in Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. But they were scattered all over, down south, in Florida. Everybody had a say. And, and the same thing with Defenders of Wildlife, when they did their little vote cards, which they claim, well, we had vast public support. We watched kids, we even filmed kids. Eight years old, marking the, the yes vote on the Defenders of Wildlife card, and that counted toward uh, supporting wolves. I've got pictures of the cards from people from Africa, from Switzerland, from Ethiopia, from Argentina, signed a card and said, yeah, we want wolves in Yellowstone National Park. And see, the thing is, is we live with the impacts that lived here. Everybody else had to say. The other side tried to portray us as wanting to annihilate every wolf. We never, ever, ever said that we wanted all the wolves gone. Our slogan was, a deal is a deal. 78 to 100 in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Granted, there's no question that the wolves have lost a lot of their habitat. So that lines them up to be put on the Endangered Species Act. But the reality is the whole North American continent is habitat for the wolves. And the biologists readily admitted even back in the 90s and even in the 80s, there were somewhere between 50 and 70,000 wolves on the North American continent. And so what they do is they go up in Canada with helicopters and they go after these wolves, they aerial gun them, they cage them, and they bring them down below the 49th parallel, which is the boundary between Canada and U.S., and all of a sudden they become endangered. The state fish and wildlife agencies from whom the 60 million was stolen, okay, you and me as hunters and fishermen, that's who really was stolen from, but our state agencies never ask for that money to be replaced. Never ask for it. Now you might ask yourself, as I did, about two years, why did that happen? Well, think about it. The State Fish and Wildlife Agency is more and more getting grant money from the federal government for this, that, and everything. Okay? So they're not going to anger the people that are going to maybe give them money or maybe freeze them out of, of their share of what they're going to be giving out next year or the year after. They were all convinced, the state guys too, hunting and fishing is on the way out, like logging and grazing. That's all going to be doing. We're all going to be, you know, living in the cities and this is all going to be a nature wonderland out here, blah, blah, blah. And uh, for us to keep our jobs, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to educate the little munchkins about Mother Nature, and we're going to we're going to just have wilderness over here and go look at it once in a while. And we're going to have roadless areas over here, marine sanctuaries over there that will patrol, and blah 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 blah. So, again, where's that money going to come from? Because there's no more longer hunting and fishing and sport excise tax and arms and ammunition money. It's going to come from the Congress going to come through the Fish and Wildlife Service, see, because that's how it's all setting up to work now. People don't understand if we don't hunt, we will ultimately lose the wildlife system that we have. It'll turn into one big zoo, and it'll be far less than what we, and you will have uh, privatized hunting, you'll have all kinds of uh, elite, hunting for the elite, like you do in Europe, they don't understand when they oppose hunting truly what they're uh, opposing. They're dealing on uh, their internal emotions and they're not using their head and they're not using the real science that's available that shows what hunting and sportsmen and the North American wildlife system provides uh, in terms of wildlife. So. Um, to me, that is a cultural war worth fighting, and we have to be in that fight. The wolf is politically defined in danger, not biologically. The wolf has never been biologically in danger of extinction, never has, ever.
Well, if people just stop for one second and see what's happening, the federal government wants control of all this. And they're getting it every day through, an, through some kind of an endangered species. They're getting it every day. They're taking our state's rights away from us. There was a meeting where a Forest Service biologist was uh, speaking to the people about the possibility of wolf recovery. This was prior to the transplant. And somebody said, why do you want to put wolves in the high country when it's known that they'll leave it? And the guy just kind of had a sheepish grin on his face and he goes, because where the wolf sets his foot, it's king. And that's what the Endangered Species Act does. The Endangered Species Act tramples over private property rights, it, over livelihoods, whatever. It just mows them down. This is a takings by the government. You know, they've taken away, they've taken away my, my capability of making a living here. I believe there's people on the left that don't particularly want my cattle on Forest Service grazing. And maybe the wolf is just a tool to them to keep us off of there. I know ranchers over on, just over these mountains in, in Idaho, salmon side, that put a hundred pair of cattle on a forest permit, come in that fall 30 calves short. They quit grazing their cattle on that forest permit because they lost 30% of their calves. They just couldn't survive that. It was, if they kept going back there with cattle, they were gonna go broke. And I think there's, there's a part of the left that wants to see that. 95% of the people want wolves. 5% don't want wolves. Okay, that, say that that's true. 95% of the people don't have to deal with the wolves, but the 5% like us are the ones that have to live with them and deal with them. Like you said, the 95% of the people that live in New York City and Los Angeles, and they don't live with the wolf. And I don't think they particularly care that we have to. It's always easier for me to be generous with your land than it is to be generous with mine. And that's kind of what people love to do. They love to tell. They're, they're very objectifying what other people should do, but they excuse themselves. For example, you know, they want to tell some rancher out in Montana how to live his life. Uh, or, uh, to take it another zone, you know, the poor Amazonian farmer is committing environmental devastation because he's trying to scratch out a living in the forest and he cuts it down to plant crops or have cattle. He's an eco-terrorist, but when I need my cottage in the Berkshires, that's progress because I need a place to relax. And besides, I'm a good person because I vote the right party. Uh, really? The best known arguments for the wolf is we need them to balance nature. But when you get to the concept of what is the balance of nature and you force the question, they really have to back up and admit that the balance of nature is dynamic. And what dynamic means is it goes up and it goes down. So there's really no thing they can, they're really not placing any trust uh, in what they're saying. Second thing is they're the symbol of wilderness, you know. They connect the web of life and all this stuff. Well, they talk, they're always talking about the ecosystem and they need the wolf to complete the ecosystem. But tell me when man hasn't been part of the ecosystem. Let me give you a quote that Norm Bishop gave me in uh, 1988. He was the research interpreter for Yellowstone National Park. And I, I said to him, I said, uh, in your concept of ecosystem, what role does man play? Now, now think about this, think about this. He said, man is either no part or a non-consumptive part of any complete ecosystem. That is a prescription for massive genocide, is what it is. This whole thing ties into what they call the Wildlands Project, uh, which is which then in, in part has Y to Y, Yellowstone to Yukon. They want to promote a corridor from Yellowstone Park to the Yukon so that grizzly bears and wolves can go back and forth. And they don't want any people in that corridor. And there, that's where the control part all comes in. It, it's, it's money and control, that's all it is. It doesn't have anything to do about saving wolves because there's lots of wolves in this world.
National Park Service uh, biologist, uh, one by the name of David Graber. He said that uh, he hoped the right virus would come along, wipe humanity off the map. That is their agenda. And here's the thing, you go, wait a second. If humanity is so bad, why don't they commit suicide? Because they're fighting like David Foreman, who started Earth First. He says, we in the environmental community, we're the eco warriors fighting for nature. So we have a right to live and we have a right to kill you. Some say you and I aren't worth much and that mankind should step aside, even go extinct and allow nature to run on its own. But the Bible says God created humans as the crown of nature and that he told us to take dominion over all of it, including wolves. If we believed this, we would have no problem using the tools he gave us to control wolf populations. This, and even the basic...